Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Eleanor Lewis and I'm a research analyst at the Legal 500. Today's webinar is titled The Evolution of Competition Law Theory and Practice. What's next? So I'll keep it brief and hand straight over to Mr. Gukainek. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we have uh, two uh, distinguished uh, academics uh, attending and also they have experience in the enforcement side of things as well. Um, uh, you see Spencer Weber Waller, a professor um, uh, and uh, also he was um, the senior advisor to the chair of the Federal Trade Commission uh, in 2022. Uh, obviously, what he will say will not be binding on either the Federal Trade Commission uh, or any enforcer, but that experience is extremely relevant and interesting. Uh, Spencer is the John Paul St Stevens Chair in Competition Law and Director of the Institute for Con Consumer Antitrust Studies and Professor at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. Um, it, he's a good friend of mine. He goes uh, way back uh, uh, um, in uh, looking into jurisdictions other than the US. He has always been a global uh, citizen of competition law uh, thought. Um, and then you have uh, Yanis Lianos, uh, who is cur currently the president of the Hellenic Competition Authority. Uh, and uh, he is a professor, chair of global competition law and public policy and founding director of the Center for Law, Economics and Society at the Faculty of Laws, University College London. Uh, on top of his position uh, at UCL, as he is currently the uh, president of the Hellenic Competition Authority uh, in Greece, obviously what he will say uh, will not have any bearing on uh, the approaches of uh, his institution either. Uh, he was um, the, uh, he was awarded the Philip uh, Leverhulm uh, Prize for his seminal research and uh, he's a laureate of the French Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. Uh, he is the co-editor of the Journal of Competition Law and Economics and of the Yearbook of European Law. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, those kinds of positions, Spencer Weber Waller uh, is a member of the advisory board of the American Antitrust Institute, and uh, he's at the editorial board of the Antitrust Law Journal. So I'm really privileged to be uh, in the company of uh, such great uh, uh, minds of uh, competition law from both sides of the Atlantic. And today's uh, exercise really is to keep it loose and give them room to maneuver in discussing uh, where are we coming from and where are we uh, heading to in terms of uh, competition law enforcement and in terms of the evolution of the intellectual side of competition law matters. Um, I will be putting some questions to them, but when we were doing a very uh, brief prep, Spence said, um, you know, I might be put, uh, putting questions to you as well. And I said, be, be my guest. Uh, so I might uh, from time to time leave the, uh, the you know, traditional capacity of a, a moderator. Yet I think it's way more interesting to hear uh, these two uh, panelists speak. Uh, your questions uh, are also going to be conveyed to them. So to the extent you have any questions, uh, please uh, write them to us and uh, we will see and uh, we will discuss uh, these questions as well. To uh, kickstart things, uh, allow me to ask um, the first question I wanted to ask, since we're discussing the evolution of competition law, one evolution that is happening in the markets is an evolution toward digital markets. Uh, and digital is uh, becoming more and more interesting. Uh, also for competition law agencies, that's not even a new thing. But um, a discussion that is from time to time happening is, uh, could the focus on enforcement in digital markets be leading to under enforcement in other sectors? Uh, obviously when one asks uh, this question, the first thing uh, one discusses internally is, well, a lot of markets are already converting into digital markets. So um, one way or another, that kind of focus on digital markets should still be bringing uh, a, a healthy competition to the dynamics of that particular market too. But there are markets like uh, cement or construction materials or chemicals or agriculture, some of foodstuffs um, that aren't that digitized. Uh, and uh, could there be a discussion 
that with the quick evolution of the markets into digital and the, the competition authorities jumping into enforcement in that field, um, uh, basically more brick and mortar uh, quintessential markets uh, fell off the radar screen? Or could it be that uh, the capacity of antitrust enforcement agencies expanded in parallel with the expansion in digital? So there is enough room for enforcement everywhere and no one is observing that kind of a, uh, uh, of a uh, potential problem. Uh, allow me to ask this to Johannes, and then uh, uh, Spencer would uh, uh, proceed. As you will realize, it will quickly turn into a chatty environment. So, you know, it's not going to be that I ask a question and in a structured fashion, one answers and the other. Uh, we'll keep it uh, conversational. Uh, Janis, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gionek, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to uh, participate to this and uh, with uh, excellent company uh, with my friend Spencer Weber Waller. Uh, and of course, you know, whatever I say today, these are my personal views. And as you said, they do not engage uh, the Atlantic Competition Commission. So uh, in terms of your question, um, I think, you know, it's a matter of uh, looking a little bit to what were the issues that have been concerning the competition authorities the last few years. I think the digital revolution was an important legal irritant, if I can actually use that term, because, you know, we had to deal with uh, the emergence, uh, very quick emergence of uh, the big tech companies, uh, uh, which uh, obviously uh, have economic power that is not related only to a specific market, but actually because of the presence and the dispensability of these big tech companies, uh, they might attract some to a certain extent, uh, uh, they might actually have power, uh, which comes out of the, um, the possibility of the, the orchestrate ecosystems. So that was a legal irritant that led to a number of uh, reflections of competition authorities, a commission number of reports, back in 2016-17. Uh, some of them have actually moved to enforcement, uh, but there hasn't been much of an enforcement uh, apart from the European Commission and, of course, the, the German uh, Bundeskartelamt. I mean, the French Competition Authority as well as the Italian Competition Authority has done uh, some work in, in Europe, but actually the rest of us haven't really enforced with regards to the, um, these digital uh, companies. And, of course, you know, uh, now with the DMA, that, um, you know, somehow leads to uh, different methods of, uh, of enforcement. Uh, now, as you said before, also, the fact is that everything is digital. I mean, you know, there we have platforms that are actually hybrid. Uh, take the example of Airbnb or uh, agritech platforms, uh, which are, are used um, uh, increasingly in smart agriculture. So, I mean, you have a digital component, you have a non-digital component. Uh, so from that perspective, I think, you know, we'll uh, probably expect enforcement activity there. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, in the recent months, in particular, uh, because of the inflationary tendencies, we have seen uh, somehow uh, a refocus on the more traditional areas of competition law enforcement, in particular uh, in the food sector, for instance, uh, as well as possibly in the construction uh, sector, as you mentioned before. So I think it's a matter of the um, important uh, uh, issues that come out uh, uh, because of the evolution of the economy that lead the competition authorities to make choices with regards to the use of their resources. So, um, you know, the digital revolution definitely is an important area that we are focusing on. But uh, right now, we also need to focus on other uh, dimensions of competition enforcement. So from that perspective, of course, you know, the, uh, the way we're going to use our resources uh, and the way we're going to prioritize our cases will be dependent on uh, also the availability of resources and also the fact that you might have a reallocation of tasks between the European Commission that could possibly focus on the digital sector, uh, in particular the big tech companies and the national competition authorities in Europe that could do uh, work in more traditional sectors, as well as, of course, in the digital, but cases concerning, for instance, e-commerce uh, or uh, platforms that are not gatekeepers. Um, so a reallocation of tasks between us could possibly, uh, I think, be more efficient. Thank you very much. Uh, Spence? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on this. Uh, it's great to see both of you. I'm sorry we can't do this in person. Um, let me just say um, uh, the same disclaimer 
as Giannis has said, uh, I did spend last year as a senior advisor at the Federal Trade Commission. I'm appearing here today just in my academic personal capacity and um, nothing I say represents the views of the FTC, the chair, the staff. Um, and when I talk about things at the FTC, I'm limited to things that are in, in, in the public domain, publicly available information. Um, with respect to your really good question, um, yeah, these cases are extremely important extremely time consuming and resource and even agencies as large as the FTC. Now I worked on the policy side, so I was not part of any case teams, but um, you know, there's only so many people you can put on any given investigation, given the full range of uh, what the FTC does. And, you know, they have something like a thousand or more uh, professionals, but again, uh, uh, more than half are engaged in consumer protection and privacy related matters on the competition side. Uh, there's litigation pending in, uh, against uh, Facebook with respect to prior acquisition of um, WhatsApp and Instagram and other uh, pending mergers uh, that, that are being litigated. And these, these take up a tremendous amount of resources. Um, but, you know, uh, if there's a, a wide economy out there. And if you look at what DOJ and FTC are, are doing, um, I, I, I think they're really doing their best to pick and choose the cases that matter across the full range of, uh, of the economy. For example, the FTC has a recently filed case that involves a program of bundled rebates and de facto exclusivity involving pesticides, um, which really isn't, uh, again, um, about a digital platform, obviously it involves certain aspects of digital commerce. The Justice Department has a, a relatively small criminal indictment recently against some sellers of DVDs uh, over the internet who apparently are accused of fixing prices. And uh, while obviously it relates to e-commerce, it has nothing to do with um, the issues of digital platforms that are attracting all the attention. And so, you know, it's, it's a mixture. And again, if you look at the announced priorities the Justice Department and the FTC in bringing uh, renewed attention to injuries to labor uh, as antitrust violations, a variety of cases involving no poach agreements, wage fixing, um, uh, um, non-compete agreements that have been the subject of FTC enforcement action and a proposed uh, rulemaking that would ban most non-compete agreements uh, in, uh, in employment contracts in the US. Um, you know, these are things that are, are really important and I think uh, whoever's at the top of any agency has to, and Giannis is in this position now, and I, I was never, um, but, you know, has to really think long and hard about how to allocate resources to do what's um, going to do the most good. And I think there's a room for small cases. I'd be curious in Giannis's view, um, but they're mostly used to make new law, um, to, uh, get attention for old law. And so, you know, you wouldn't think that this uh, DVD indictment uh, has particular great economic significance other than its deterrent value way beyond the specific firms who've been accused of this. And nothing's happened. Uh, the trial hasn't taken place yet. Um, but, you know, I, you, you look at these small cases and you realize you have to bring some of them, but, but you can't bring all of them. And so uh, you're, you're mixing and matching and they're you know, we know there's litigation in, uh, brought by the Justice Department already against Google, and there's litigation and there's public information that there are, you know, other investigations of Amazon and Apple going on in the United States, and the rest of the agencies, and remember the private enforcement, is on the full range of economic activity. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure the audience will want to ask questions as well, but allow me to continue with what I have in mind, and as they uh, punch in their questions at the uh, Q&A side of uh, the screen. Uh, I'll be happy to be the conduit through which uh, the, these questions flow to you. Uh, one question that, that is easy to ask and is interesting um, uh, to, to um, observe uh, what, since we're discussing the evolution is um, that truly uh, there are some steps that are taken in the antitrust world <clears throat> that uh, bring into the forefront of antitrust enforcement certain concepts that were really not seen as important. We were all flying over it. Non-solicitation has been one of them. Um, Non-solicitation was always a thing. We would have always discussed this in a whether it's an ancillary restraint or not kind of a capacity, but no one really ex expected 
full on uh, enforcement uh, that is targeting non solicitation, no poach type of um, arrangements in different jurisdictions just uh, until, say, five years ago. I'm actually keeping it quite long. I could even say maybe three years ago. And then uh, the US has started showing attention to it, the EU has started showing attention to it. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of a general counsel who has been doing, uh, um, you know, compliance work for decades. Um, sure enough, this person is going to be sucker punched by this sudden evolution of uh, antitrust to jump on a new topic. I don't mean to have you discuss uh, non solicitation uh, where it is today, if you want to, obviously, but more interesting to me uh, is what do you think could be the new non solicitation, i.e., something that you suspect is brewing in there, something that is not getting that much of an attention, but um, it may uh, actually become uh, a central issue for antitrust enforcement. I know that I didn't uh, uh, give any pre-warning about this particular question when we were doing the prep. I, I thought of this question yesterday, and sorry for that. Uh, but whoever wants to take it on, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in the response because um, with all the experience that, that you have, you must have had the feeling that something is actually showing a lot of potential, but is not getting its full value uh, at the moment, and it may become a, a headache, or it may become uh, an important uh, topic of enforcement. Um, whoever wants to take it, take it on first. Uh, I mean, uh, if I may uh, intervene here, um, you have, of course, you know, the the policy and academic debate that uh, uh, sometimes that always precedes a little bit the enforcement uh, issues that you raise. I mean, with regards, for instance, to uh, labor um, and uh, labor markets, I mean, this was uh, a concern that was expressed by uh, a number of authors um, before basically uh, the virus to competition authorities, first in the US and then in Europe, starting dealing with one of the aspects uh, of um, you know, labor markets, which is actually the no poaching agreements, which is the horizontal aspect. Of course, you know, uh, there has been um, a story here that um, you know, precedes basically this debate. Um, you know, labor markets was any particular labor power, market power, uh, or monopsony actually at the labor side was something that was discussed decades ago, I mean, John Robinson, for instance, in uh, her work in the 1930s have been raising this issue. I mean, of course, this was forgotten for a long period of time. Um, and the reason I think that came up uh, was um, that a number of academic circles were interested in the, in, the, in the sense that, you know, productivity was increasing, but then an important part of that, uh, the surplus value of that productivity increase uh, wasn't going to, uh, to labor. And, you know, that raised concerns about you know, is are we really should we focus more on the labor markets in particular in view of the fact also that many of these platforms have monopsonistic positions, monopsony positions. So uh, with regards to that, I would say, I mean, uh, the recent discussions about sustainability, um, which I think offer uh, any particular the related issue of industrial policy considerations in competition enforcement, I think, you know, could be issues to, uh, to uh, ponder in the next uh, few years. Um, I will say the same about um, uh, the use of uh, uh, new, um, you know, approaches like complexity science uh, in, uh, in competition enforcement. I think this will uh, generate a sort of a revolution in the sense that in the way that we are um, collecting evidence, we're assessing evidence in the context of the competition authorities, also with regards to the uh, evidential standards that the competition authorities might have in cases and the way the courts will deal with cases which are uh, coming with uh, evidence uh, through like not uh, the classic econometric or economic models, but actually big data type of evidence or complexity science based evidence. I think these could be interesting issues for, uh, for the future. Uh, but maybe, you know, Spencer has other uh, suggestions here and I can think of, of many more uh, in the next yeah. few minutes. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Giannis, but I have, I have a couple other things that I think may reflect my, my U.S. focus, despite my interest in, in, in other markets and other jurisdictions. One is, um, I don't know if this is what you meant, but um, one is the, the goals of antitrust. Um, yeah. you know, uh, it's been 
a 40 year cycle of predominantly a consumer welfare slash Chicago school approach in the United States. And there've been voices, myself included, Giannis and, and others, um, both younger and, and older uh, than us, um, you know, who've been arguing the other side. But um, for the moment, there's folks who've had tremendous uh, roles in these debates who are in charge of the agencies now, um, including Tim Wu, who's left the White House, but Lena Khan at the FTC, Jonathan Cantor, and various voices in, in academia and in a non-governmental sort of anti-monopoly movement that I think is really important. And the issue for them will be whether these changes stick, which uh, will involve at some point changing the nature of the judiciary in the United States mm -hmm. or persuading a conservative skeptical uh, ju uh, judiciary to uh, be open to more theories. But as the specific inside um, antitrust, the labor and monopsony stuff, I think, is going to get a huge amount of attention, which wasn't the case five, 10 years ago. Um, there's a recognition that labor markets in, in a lot of areas are very, very thin. And that, for example, um, poultry and, and, and uh, um, uh, meat producers often face a single buyer because it's sort of a local thing. If you're raising chickens or cattle, you may not have a choice by geography other than dealing with one or maybe two processors. And so um, also it is a huge sea change if the labor, if the um, merger guidelines that are under discussion, under revision, if they include um, a, a different kind of discussion of labor issues, all of a sudden mergers that produce savings through firings uh, or, uh, or wage reductions, if those emerge as in essence, not a defense anymore, but as a confession, that's a huge change and a really important one. And I'll add one more it, besides the emphasis on non-competes. Again, uh, nobody thought much about them except as a potential rule of reason uh, violation. But the evolution was smart in a way. So maybe, maybe people feel blindsided. Uh, they may. But it's been an evolution from a petition to the FTC to do something to hearings within the FTC, to civil cases from the FTC, to a proposed rule. On the mm -hmm. non-solicitation side, which you've talked about, same idea where a, a civil case was brought, a guide for uh, uh, human resources uh, was put out, uh, warnings were brought that they would be uh, prosecuted criminally if, if things continued. Uh, private litigation has played an important role in seeking compensation for these things. And then it's only recently that the Department of Justice has brought some criminal cases to uh, with different results, depending on the facts. So you can see how they've been rolling this out such that they didn't start with um, criminal prosecutions or you know dawn raids or FBI and anything no. like that. Um, I'll lay out one more. We can talk about maybe why sustainability is or isn't um, the same uh, degree of penetration into US antitrust. Now, let me throw one on the table. Um, again, in recently, um, in different ways, People in the US for the first time in recent memory are beginning to look more abroad to see how notions of abusive dominance can be worked into the existing section two jurisprudence mm -hmm. or perhaps changing that by um, legislation or rule. Uh, interesting, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd see, I think there's a lot of cross-fertilization. Um, I mean, issues that uh, were mostly, you know, attracting attention in the US in the past like you know, invitations to collude or price signaling uh, through the Section 5 of the FTC Act now are becoming more and more interesting also uh, on the European side. I mean, we have in Greece a new uh, legislation that actually uh, puts forward this price signaling and invitation to collude. Uh, and you know, there's all this discussion about uh, a, a number of competition authorities in Europe adopting something like the market investigation uh, reference tool in the UK, which will deal with these issues of oligopoly where you cannot really enforce articles 101 and 102, but you need to have some form of, uh, of intervention. So uh, I think this is an issue that is now in, uh, in, uh, in Europe quite, quite, quite significant. Um, and more generally with regards to the goals, just one, one thing, I, you know, I think there we see uh, across the Atlantic um, a, a shift, a paradigm shift. I mean, you know, we, from the, I would say the classic loan economic approach or no, no classical price here approach to uh, what has some authors have called the uh, loan political economy synthesis, uh, which is basically a, a broader source of um, 
uh, uh, of um, a social research type of analysis, um, you know, sociology, economic sociology, or political economy that uh, has a different, basically, uh, the different focus on issues of power, uh, multi-level governance and pluralism, equality and democracy. And I think these are issues that are uh, becoming quite important in the US as far as I can see, but also increasingly so um, in particular uh, parts in, in Europe. So, um, so I think these are issues to, uh, to think about in the future. So I'm just curious, do you, do you think um, uh, the jurisdictions that you're most familiar with are seeing the same development, which in the U.S. we mostly call either the neo-Brandeisian or sometimes the long political economy that you were just talking about. Do you see the same kind of changes in in, in I will in not the last few years? I don't think I don't think it's uh, the same extent. But uh, you know, there's a very lively debate also in Europe with regards to uh, these issues, and some competition authorities uh, are more open uh, than others. Okay, so but uh, but I think definitely it's a, it's an issue that. Well, the goals of competition law has been set. I mean, the, you know, I mean, uh, in my own work, I've been, you know, putting forward this uh, polycentric competition law model, um, and I think to a certain extent, you know, we see um, some inroads in, in that. I mean, with the fact that you know we take into account different parameters of competition than price output. I mean, private sustainability, uh, stability, um, you know, resilience. All these issues are coming in. So. Yes, I think, you know, we are moving towards that. I mean, the, you know, the labor uh, uh, issue is also quite interesting. I mean, in Europe, we have this collective bargaining uh, possibility, um, uh, uh, in particular with regards to digital platforms. So um, so I think increasingly so the various condition authorities want to engage with these debates. Yeah, but the, the, different the labor, extents. The labor issue is, is truly interesting because uh, I, I'm remembering from my own experience um, we had written an academic uh, piece, uh, which then got published. I, I, I see it in front of me now. This was called Competition Law Issues in the Human Resources Field. And we published this 10 years ago uh, in the Journal of Econ uh, European Com Competition Law and Practice uh, in uh, April 2013, we've published this. I remember the journey of publishing it. Uh, it was a good piece. And today it would be considered as, yeah, you know, they're looking into something that needs to be looked into. Back in the day, a lot of journals were taking, ah, you know, isn't it uh, quasi understood to be exempt from competition law? Uh, is there any juice in this? And, and all that. Um, ultimately, uh, Journal of European Competition Law and Practice had published it. But I remember noting mentally that, you know, we may have gotten into a field that is in, in people's minds uh, seen as, as almost exempt from competition law enforcement. And then suddenly, uh, well, not so suddenly, but in uh, about five to seven years from that, uh, it has uh, walked into the forefront of uh, competition law enforcement. It's interesting. Yeah. So um, one question that I, I uh, really am uh, interested in, in terms of um, uh, the evolution of competition law, because uh, throughout my career, I, I have seen a, a huge shift uh, uh, in my view, is the positioning between the US and the EU uh, in terms of both the enforcement and regulatory side of leadership and the intellectual leadership. A case could be made that the intellectual leadership is still has, has still not moved from the US to the EU, it may not. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, on the enforcement and regulatory side, there are at least quite a number of sub um, fields of competition law or channels of competition law where undisputedly uh, the EU is the locomotive of enforcement and regulation. Now that's for younger people who are following us. Uh, you know, they may be interested in knowing certain anecdotal things. For example, back in 2001, when I was practicing in New York, um, you had the, in the merger control field, you had the GE Honeywell, very recent. Uh, then in 2002, I was still in the US practicing antitrust law. Uh, there was Air Tours first choice. Um, uh, Microsoft won uh, was happening in uh, the EU already. 
Um, so I, I think it must have been August 2000 that the first statement of objections in, the, in Microsoft One was uh, delivered. Um, and it, it felt different from the US case. And then it was found out in March 2004 that it was actually different. And I ended up actually moving from the US to the EU to take part in that, uh, in that defense of Microsoft. Um, and, you know, it, back in those days, 2001, 2, 3, 2004, 2, uh, I'll say, um, the understanding was that the U.S. is uh, doing this in a very sophisticated manner. The economic analysis is way more sophisticated. The, the enforcement underpinnings on the economic analysis is much better built. And the EU is trying to catch up with it. Um, Fast forward uh, two decades, now we're in 2023, uh, and a lot of shots are being called by the EU. There are certain fields where, like sustainability and competition law, for example, the intellectual leadership is with the EU as well, on top of the regulatory and uh, uh, enforcement leadership. Um, you could say that data protection and competition law, privacy issues and competition law, these are all also handled more um, as, as a you know, groundbreaking forefront enforcement in the EU. Question is, why is this uh, shift happening? Is there reason to expect that this particular shift in gravitas um, uh, will continue? Uh, is this a conscious preference or is it something uh, that is naturally happening because of the evolution of businesses and other regulatory fields? What, what is your take on this? Uh, maybe. Uh, this time with Spence uh, first, and then Giannis. Uh, sure. Um, I, I've written about this um, in, a, in an article that I've called the Omega Man and or the Isolation of U.S. Antitrust Law. The Omega Man, by the way, is an enjoyable but bad science fiction movie uh, with Charlton Heston from the uh, 1970s. It's, it's a metaphor. I don't have time to get into it. But, um, but the reality is, yeah, the United States has been isolated from the global conversation, particularly with respect to the uh, unilateral um, uses of power by single firms. Um, there has been a relentless retreat as to the scope and application of Section 2 by our Supreme Court in the last 30, 40 years, uh, culminating in a, the Trinco case, which uh, to me had shockingly praiseful language for monopoly power in a case about whether or not it had been abused. Um, and as a result, um, that puts the U.S. Uh, in a corner where the rest of the world, for a bunch of reasons I lay out in the article, and I think most of the people on this call are more familiar with, the EU has a leadership position and a model to deal with the abuse of a dominant position as the way to deal with single firm conduct. It's not perfect. Their critics uh, can be used wisely or, or poorly, um, but that's a model that obviously applies in the EU is adopted by the member states who can even go further um, and is uh, as a matter of formal legal obligation or just persuasiveness adopted by many, many trading partners of the EU. Next to nobody approaches the enforcement of, of uh, antitrust to single firm conduct the way we do on section two. We're in a corner and I think oh, in past administrations <clears throat> have made it worse. This is both Democrats and Republicans. Um, if you go back to who was in power at different times, including GE Honeywell, the U.S. has spent a lot of time and energy yelling at the rest of the world that they're doing it wrong and sometimes yeah. doing so in very offensive and personal terms. Um, and <clears throat> I'm pleased that the current administration appears to be adopting both different substantive ways of looking at the law within the framework that we have. There's legislation that would change the actual wording. New York State has a bill that would actually introduce literally the abuse of a dominant position into the state antitrust law, things like that. But separate from what we're trying to do in baby steps to make our law and policy closer to the rest of the world, we're coming to international meetings and conferences, both the public sector, private sector, NGOs, and we seem to be doing a better job of trying to listen rather than to lecture the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yanis? I think it's, it's a um, issue of investment, um, I think, in R&D. I mean, the U.S. has done a major investment in antitrust enforcement in the 1960s, 70s. Then it shifted, you know, towards this more economic Chicago approach in the 80s and the post-Chicago in the 1990s. So there has been a lot of interesting research 
that led also to uh, uh, you know different policy options uh, and enforcement. So uh, there was a lot of things going on in the U.S. A lot of you know lessons for uh, the EU. I mean, many students and you know myself included uh, moved to the U.S. to study uh, this more economic approach to to competition enforcement, as we call it in Europe. Um, I would say, however, uh, since the early 2000s, there has been much less investment uh, in the US in antitrust law enforcement. I think we, um, and, and obviously Spencer might confirm that, I mean, we had less and less courses in antitrust enforcement, less and less investment in academia, I mean, new hirings in antitrust in American universities. Uh, but, you know, in Europe, we, we saw an increase of the investment um, in competition law, in particular, you know, after the implementation of the EU merger control in the early 90s and the move towards this more economic approach, starting with merger control and then, you know, moving to the other fields of competition law. So Europe has invested considerably in terms of education and research um, in, uh, in competition law. Um, and of course, you know, at the same time, with regards to the enforcement, as you said, uh, Yonank, I mean, the Microsoft case in Europe was a little bit uh, some kind of follow-up of the uh, 1990s American debates, of course, you know, leading to different outcomes. But since then, I would say, I mean, the European uh, um, enforcement has skyrocketed. I mean, we have yeah. seen very interesting uh, cases, not extremely innovative, you know, from a, you know, the different versions of the leveraging theory, but still, you know, um, uh, I think we have seen some enforcement, some reflection. Uh, and I will say, I mean, in the uh, 2010s, we have seen in Europe, uh, a different approaches coming in. I mean, uh, you know, uh, after the more economic approach uh, or, you know, more technological approach, I mean, if we can use the term of a colleague, uh, we have seen, you know, the greener approach um, or the polycentric approach, which actually tries to deal with a number of issues like privacy, uh, other dimensions of uh, social sustainability, uh, which uh, became uh, the focus of the European academia, which I think is quite innovative in this area. And then, you know, I would say um, it's only the last couple of years that in the U.S. we have seen, um, you know, some reinvestment in the antitrust, uh, you know, uh, issue. I mean, the antitrust uh, field, which doesn't really come from the people that were actually doing antitrust. Well, it actually comes from mostly outsiders. I mean, there has been a lot of research in um, uh, by people that haven't been really in the um, you know, um, in the Antos group um, originally, I mean, people that were doing constitutional law, people from the NGOs, different institutes, et cetera, uh, that have been thinking about uh, the evolution of capitalism. And then, you know, they obviously included antitrust as one of the dimensions of their broader study. I mean, that was a more transformational study about the whole, you know, the whole legal system, not just competition law. And we have seen actually a lot of investment uh, there in the last few years in the U.S. and obviously now with uh, the new leadership at the DOJ and FTC, we see also uh, more enforcement coming in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not easy to make predictions about who is going to be uh, the enforcement and the intellectual leader of the future, mm -hmm. but I would say it will be a very close game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think the real issue is, is there's strong evidence of, of of real interest in progressive change, and the the, the question is how do you make that stick? Some of it is just dependent on elections, but within the intellectual communities, um, it means it means something more. This is not just you know who, who's in office. Many of these changes, um, in fairness, started during the Trump administration. Yeah. The, the issue, the interest in labor issues, predates. Uh, well, it's Obama, Trump, and now Biden in the United States. It comes from labor law scholars who suddenly realize that antitrust had. Uh, you know, an important aspect for their work. And so how do you make these progressive changes stick? In the US, one of the nice things is this whole of government approach that the Biden administration has adopted by executive order, where you try to come up with creative coalitions of agencies, enforcers, and powers to tackle things that matter in the real world. Um, some of it just has to do with the prosecutorial discretion of our agencies. Some of it has to do with how do you interact with the public at, at large, not in addition to the legal public that we're probably talking to today, but how do you convince people in the real world that antitrust matters and is in their best interest who aren't going to be aware of the fine stroke differences between a neo-Chicago approach and this and that? 
and this cuts against, by the way, just solely focusing on digital markets. You want to persuade the average person that antitrust matters and that you should support government efforts to do the changes that are going on. In part, you have to go after um, things that hurt their bottom line kitchen table interests, whether that's food, whether that's construction, whether that's transportation, whether that's fuel, uh, whatever it is. And so, you know, you have to pick and choose yeah. Watch and tell your story in a way that um, makes sense. And, you know, I'm very proud of what I'm seeing some of the government agencies do to tell their story because um, the rulemaking against non-competes is controversial. I don't know when and how it will be finalized because it just was proposed very recently. But, you know, it's nice to see the decision makers. It's even nice to see the people who think this is a bad idea. It's nice to see them on the national news and the front page of the newspapers, not just in the law reviews and the, the legal conferences. Yeah, yeah. And if I may add to this, I mean, you know, we, we don't have to uh, obviously focus only on the, on the progressive side. I mean, I think we can see very interesting yeah. ideas, innovative ideas as well. At the libertarian side of the spectrum. I mean, I think it's quite, uh, you know, what is really happening is that both in Europe and the US, you have see, you basically see more and more of a uh, approach of dialogue uh, in a way coming in, in different between different tendencies, you know, the more libertarian one from one side, the, the more progressive one. And I think that's very useful because uh, that will, uh, you know, it's, it's very good if things are debated. Um, uh, there's a, a broader policy debate to which different stakeholders uh, contribute. Um, and I think that's the enriching, the, the, the enrichment of, of competition law that comes out of it. Um, so we should welcome this type of, uh, of dialogue uh, between yeah. different camps, uh, if I can use that term. Um, it, it, it's also interesting to observe that probably the wedge um, um, between, um, the enforcement preferences at the two sides of the Atlantic has never been uh, bigger or stronger um, than uh, the sustainability debate. And um, it, that begs for the question of uh, what the two of you feel the future of sustainability discussion in uh, competition law is. Um, maybe put differently, have we already realized the full potential of uh, the sustainability debate in competition law because uh, sustainability in and of itself has become so important uh, for the overall evolution of humankind that it has made very heavy inroads into competition law, but actually it is ahead of the demand in competition law. Or could we say that this is just a prelude and actually uh, there is uh, way more room to, uh, to improve in terms of the legislative um, uh, infrastructure. Um, maybe subsets of the question is, is the issue, so we know that the issue is real. The sustainability matter is real. There's no discussion about that. But is the antitrust relevance being exaggerated? Uh, is there really an antitrust angle to it that required all the guidances and the exemptions, whatnots? Uh, is there demand from businesses for this guidance or these exemptions? Or are we jumping on this subject because it's important and hip, so it has to have a reflection on competition law? Yanis, maybe? Okay, interesting uh, question. Um, I will say, uh, you know, you're both right and wrong in the sense that um, Yes, maybe at the beginning of this debate uh, that really, um, you know, wasn't really an important issue a few years ago. I mean, I remember organizing a conference back in 2018 uh, uh, in Brussels with the participation of uh, the commissioner, um, as well as uh, a number of uh, uh, green um, and, um, you know, um, ecological type of, you know, um, uh, uh, movements. And, um, and this, this was really a new issue at the time, even if, you know, a number of our, uh, my colleagues um, have published work in, in, in the past about, you know, green and competition law, and they have been extremely important in the discussion. But, um, you know, it was a, a new issue. And um, look, uh, six, seven years later, I mean, we have so many uh, discussions about sustainability. Uh, we have so many competition authorities and competition law systems adopting specific statutes that will accommodate you know, the sustainability competition interaction. Uh, we, you know, the Atlantic Competition Commission have been playing quite a important role there also to promote 
sustainability concerns with the sandbox, et cetera. Um, and, um, and of course, you know, there's been some exaggeration probably in terms of the, you know, the interest of the business community. Yes, I mean, there's been interest from the business community at the beginning. Um, probably, you know, we see now and we're waiting to see, you know, more, uh, you know, the businesses coming in and using these uh, tools uh, like the sandbox or, or the guidelines. But I, I think, you know, uh, it's a matter of time for this to, to develop further. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we all understood that this was a moment that where the competition authorities could um, possibly bring forward uh, this new issue of uh, sustainability. Um, uh, the green transition was a very important issue in a number of, uh, of countries in Europe. Um, and to a certain extent, we're acting um, uh, in conformity with uh, the broader, basically, uh, Green Deal type of, you know, objective uh, that the Commission actually had. Um, so I, you know, I believe that uh, this is an important issue and we'll probably see uh, more of that. It will start with really at the beginning of, of the whole process. Um, and of course, you know, there are the risks of the greenwashing, et cetera, that many have put forward. But, um, you know, I believe that uh, um, uh, there is a lot of um, potential there to develop this and in particular, you know, to um, disseminate as well uh, green technologies around the world. So, I mean, it might you know, right now it's a kind of a first world uh, issue, if I can use that term, uh, something that develop uh, uh, the competition those in developed countries are focusing on. But I think uh, you know we need to uh, think more broadly about the dissemination of these uh, green technologies and this transfer of technology uh, also in a number of other uh, jurisdictions, the emerging economies, and the developing world because we're talking about you know a global you know, transition to the green economy, because otherwise we don't do that globally. I mean, there's uh, there's no point, um, you yeah. know, climate change is a global issue. Yeah, yeah. Ben? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, um, it's really hard for a US academic, uh, uh, sorry, antitruster mm -hmm. to, um, we don't have a leadership position on this because of the way our antitrust laws have been interpreted. So I love to torture my students with two versions of kind of the same thing. One would be, you know, what if all the toy manufacturers got together and agreed to eliminate lead paint because of the health concerns, lead paint on the toys. <clears throat> and then more, more realistically, you know, what if all the car manufacturers agreed to um, stop manufacturing gas powered cars by, by the year 2035 or whatever it is, um, just make only electric vehicles now or then, uh, what would you do about it? What could you do about it? And any of those things run into a tradition in US antitrust law that we look at the competitive effects and we don't take into account general social welfare concerns. None, there's no social welfare concern more important than sustainability. Um, but the problem is uh, there's strong case law and no equivalent of 1013. There's strong case law that says you're answering the question of whether this arrangement does or doesn't harm competition. And the fact that it achieves some other goal that we all like um, is not within the sphere of antitrust. So what it means is for the US, we are more dependent on legislation, uh, which isn't going well right now because of political gridlock and other controversies uh, that um, uh, make it hard to, to, to do. And we're doing the best we can. We're, we play a role in international diplomacy on climate stuff that I'm not an expert in. Um, but from an antitrust standpoint, the best we can do right now, absent new tools, is to use a little prosecutorial discretion. And in my view, avoid situations like uh, in the Trump administration where they were looking at potential agreements between car companies to continue to adhere to some higher mileage per gallon standards for their vehicles when they were no longer legally obligated to do so uh, um, for administrative law reasons. Um, uh, that case never went anywhere, but um, in my view, was not a good use of resources. Um, I also thought it wasn't actually a violation of the antitrust laws and uh, nothing, no further action was taken. But at the end of the day, we don't have an easy mechanism. And um, again, for a variety of reasons, um, the EU is in a better position to do this. But uh, we don't have a way of saying, sure, this might harm competition, but it's worth it in terms of the sustainability. Mm -hmm. well, I add here, I mean, it's, it's a matter of the institutional differences between the EU and the US. I mean, the role of courts uh, in the U.S. is predominant in the in the enforcement of U.S. law, and courts obviously they need to uh, adjudicate the specific dispute they have in front of them. I mean, they cannot necessarily take into account 
these uh, more polycentric type of issues like sustainability, uh, either environmental or, or social. Uh, in Europe, I think, you know, uh, we are mostly relying on competition enforcement authorities, so public enforcement. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are technocratic type of institutions that have uh, integrated, um, you know, different types of learning. I mean, economics, uh, now data science, and potentially, you know, they might also integrate um, sustainability related type of uh, uh, issues uh, in their personnel. I mean, um, you know, we, with the Dutch authority, the Greek authority has uh, published a technical report about, uh, you know, evaluating uh, sustainability arguments um, in competitional enforcement. So, you know, this is easier to do uh, in the institutional context like that of the uh, EU than uh, in the US, uh, you know, uh, court centric uh, system of competitional enforcement. Well, I, the analogy that I would say is, I mean, I think you're right. I think you guys are the leaders for all the reasons you said. <clears throat> Um, when, uh, when the U.S. has taken the lead in integrating labor into antitrust, it has required reframing it as traditional antitrust issues, not an exemption from or a, a different way of saying yes, but it was, it was really just saying, ah, you're just missing the right frame. It's a traditional monopsony frame. It's a traditional merger um, theory um, to the labor market rather than a product market. So, you know, we had to jump through those hoops and maybe we're ahead of the rest of the world on these issues. Maybe we're not, but we're clearly behind on sustainability. And I know that the first time I really learned much about that issue, gave it much thought, I was doing some teaching in England at Oxford, and I was co-teaching with Simon Holmes, who was a, 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 a distinguished antitrust lawyer, judge, um, uh, and teacher, uh, who, who was writing a stream of scholarship that continues to this day about how to do this in antitrust. Um, uh, it's sustainability and antitrust using all the tools that you said. And I just thought, well, I just I hadn't heard about that in a U.S. antitrust context before. And now I'm finally, you know, beginning to get more, uh, understand why. And uh, you have a first mover advantage and it's going to it's going to continue for a while. Yeah, that, that's right. So on on the topic of evolution of competition law, obviously, we can't do without a more direct look into the evolution of uh, the prime objective of competition law. Now, we've talked about it with given examples in the uh, capacity of responding to other questions, but uh, um, would you agree that things are changing in terms of the perception of the prime objective of uh, competition law? Um, back in the day, in, in 2001, I had uh, published a book uh, published by the Turkish Competition Authority, and, and this was called The Prime Objective of Competition Law from a Law and Economics Perspective. Um, and the debate really felt like it's a debate between, you know, social welfare maximization, i.e. total welfare maximization versus consumer welfare maximization. Um, you know, should we only concern ourselves with uh, enlarging the pie as much as we can? And then its redistribution should be a subject of the policy tools of other legal disciplines, or should we concern ourselves with, um, income distribution matters as well, and all that. You know, in, in fighting inflation, should it be a goal? A protection of uh, small businesses, should it be a goal? And, you know, I had written the book and it was published. And um, ultimately, I, I was taking the side of, you know, social welfare maximization. And, uh, but um, to this day, uh, I, I don't remember uh, any other era where people are discussing so many other uh, potential objectives of uh, competition law or, you know, loudly broadcasting that um, they would uh, directly see a difference between a cartel among private jet uh, brokers versus a cartel in red yeast. Um, both are cartels, both would demand resources of uh, enforcement agencies, but one hits the rich, the other hits the poor, or everyone uh, in one go. So, you know, we're going to go after the second one. Um, would you agree that um, we're uh, in a different era of perception of uh, the prime objective of competition law? And if so, in what sense? If I, could, if I could start, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, yes, the 
you know, the, the cartel for the jet brokers, yacht brokers, whatever it is, you know, it's a per se violation. In my view, um, it harms people who can take care of their own interests through private litigation, perhaps bargaining with, with the people who are ripping them off. They can take care of themselves. Um, and it's appropriate to concentrate resources uh, with the aim of uh, protecting those who, who cannot protect themselves um, and, and obviously the broader um, society. The nicest, I thought the most elegant way I've seen a great explanation for why this frame has broadened is uh, there's a, a lawyer and economist, Jonathan Baker, uh, mm -hmm. at American University in, in Washington, DC, who's written a bunch of pieces. The best, uh, the, the easiest, the most directly on point is called Antitrust as a Political Bargain. His, um, his argument is that, um, you know, uh, the Chicago School Revolution, in his view, isn't all bad. It focused on efficiency arguments that were being ignored, but it was part of a bargain, implicit or explicit, that the efficiencies and savings unlocked by permitting certain arrangements would flow to the broader society and those less fortunate. And, we, and he believes that they got the, you know, they got the lenient antitrust enforcement, but they didn't get the, the benefit of the bargain. And if, if that's true, that's a really nice way to explain why um, there's been a, a, a broader um, interest in opening up antitrust and a, a broader interest in looking at the, the abuse of power. And so, you know, I see that that explains it in antitrust and in the whole broader thing, going back to Occupy Wall Street, to concerns about inequality. And, you know, if you think about antitrust as a tool to control the abuses of power, you get both a broader frame and a natural uh, interest in looking at uh, what the EU and many, many other jurisdictions have always done, rather than the U.S. Uh, more uh, cowboy capitalism approach. Yeah, yeah. Jonas? Um, I mean, of course, you know, there's an ideological debate issue. And of course, you know, Thomas Piketty in his recent book, uh, you know, puts focus on the, the fact that the ideology might play, you know, driving role sometimes in, uh, you know, uh, in the way also economics, uh, economic theory is generated. Um, but I think, you know, in, in this context, I will not talk about that, of course, you know, uh, but um, I think, you know, 10 years ago, I wrote a paper about the goals of competition law, basically saying that, you know, uh, it's something that you need to answer after you have identified what are the institutions that enforce competition law. I mean, you know, the goals in a system with courts uh, might be different in courts playing a central role. It might be different from, you know, uh, a, the goals in a system where you have uh, uh, independent uh, competition authorities or a system where you have uh, uh, you know, the commission, which is not just a competition authority, but actually does a number, a number of other things, okay? So uh, the institutional framework, I think, plays a very important role about uh, the goals uh, that you're, you're going to have. So we cannot really have a, a, a universal answer to, to, to that question. Now, uh, that said, you know, I think um, because of the more economic approach and, the, you know, the what I have, you know, I've called in a, in a different paper, um, the separability thesis. I mean, issues of efficiency should be distinguished from issues of distribution, which is very much a part of the neoclassical paradigm. I mean, uh, competition law enforcement in the 1980s during the, um, you know, the period of the, uh, of the uh, integration of the more economic approach have focused on social uh, uh, welfare, I mean, on economic welfare, basically. Um, and in particular, uh, total welfare or a specific dimension of consumer welfare that will be just a consumer surplus, but not necessarily uh, the transfer of wealth. Now, um, I think, you know, the, the last few years has been a lot of work on uh, looking a little bit to the competition law as uh, a broader, uh, you know, taking a broader perspective, looking a little bit as part of the social contract, if I can use the uh, the term of, uh, of Mahal Michael Gal or you know, a uh, form of social regulation, if I can actually use the term that I use um, in, in my work. Um, and uh, what we see also is that the concept of economic efficiency uh, can be, you know, can have different meanings. I mean, usually the people that have been um, the adepts of the more economic approach, they focus on economic efficiency from the point of view of output and price, you know. Um, but the way actually European courts uh, use the concept of economic efficiency is different. I mean, uh, and the commission, of course, I mean, they're referring to other issues like variety, quality, innovation, consumer choice. And maybe, you know, in the, in the recent 
um, uh, guidance of the European, I mean, draft basically uh, guidance for the market definition of this. Um, he, I think it's one of the, I think the first paragraphs in probably paragraph 16 or 15, I can't remember now. I mean, the, uh, the commission puts forward the idea that all the different parameters of competition, like sustainability, resilience, and others. So, you know, and, and you know, they make discussion about efficiency. Huh? So, uh, uh, so I think the, the concept of efficiency can be interpreted in, in different um, uh, ways. Um, and I think, you know, a very important aspect here is also the fact that, you know, we don't necessarily only now uh, rely on, on economic models and um, economics as a, you know, the principal source of wisdom. I mean, we're opening up particularly because of the use of, of data um, and the availability of data. Um, we can also, you know, open up to uh, different sources of wisdom, like, you know, uh, complexity science, as I mentioned before, it could be economic sociology research, uh, research on financialization, and um, uh, also um, inequality. Um, so, and I think, you know, this is something that uh, 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 might be integrated, you know, slowly into the competition law framework. I mean, at least one might argue for that and uh, uh, competition authorities might invest in this type of uh, research uh, for their own work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, um maybe close on the note of the very first question that we have tackled um, and, and go back to um, this, the debate that we started all this with. Uh, remember, I had asked if uh, there might be uh, uh, too much focus on enforcement in digital markets. Uh, could this be leading to under enforcement in other sectors? And we have discussed this a little bit. I see a question from Nick Peristerakis uh, and he says, do you think there is a disproportionate focus on enforcement against the large digital platforms, given many other current issues facing consumers, such as high energy prices or other traditional hardcore abuses that take place in more traditional sectors of the economy? Now, this is a, a, a spin-off of the very first debate we had, but uh, maybe to make sure that we're addressing uh, a, a question, um, would you like to spend two minutes each on uh, this particular question, are, maybe to to focus my initial question, are we focusing too much on GAFAM? Uh, might be a way of uh, asking the question too. If I may answer, I mean, and uh, thank you, Nikos, for, uh, for your question. Um, I mean, you know, it depends on the competition authority. I mean, if you talk about the European Commission, I'm not entirely sure that the Commission has um, focused only on enforcing against uh, large uh, digital platforms. Actually, they're doing a number of other cases in the pharma sector, you know, the energy, et cetera. So uh, it's not that they have been focusing only on, 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 on big tech. Um, uh, and again, you know, you have to think of the European system as a system, you know, in a sense you have the commission, but then you have a number of national competition authorities. And there's a lot of enforcement of EU competition law by national competition authorities, which might focus probably uh, 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 more on issues of you know, energy prices or uh, food prices uh, in their own jurisdiction, because these are also local kind of related issues. Of course, you have the more global food value chain type of issue, but uh, still, you know, a number of, um, uh, of, uh, of these uh, type of cases concern, you know, uh, supermarket chains and, uh, you know, the agricultural sector, which are basically uh, national. So, I mean, if they, taking the European system as a whole, you know, the European Commission and then national authorities, I don't necessarily think that there's a disproportionate focus of enforcement. I mean, it's probably more attention by the commentators and mm -hmm. academia mm -hmm. on digital because that's really new and uh, a whole issue. And you have all these uh, new regulations uh, come in and how these will, I mean, the AI Act, the Data Act, the DMA, the DSA, yeah. Data Governance Act, and how these will interact with competition enforcement. So that's a quite interesting issue for academics. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that uh, there's more enforcement on, about digital and less about other areas. Uh, now, I don't know exactly in the US uh, what's going on, but I guess similar, uh, you know, you have also uh, the states that are also enforcing state uh, law and uh, as well as uh, federal law, I guess. And so um, in courts, you know, um, not in, in, in state courts. So maybe, you know, if you take the whole system, you know, it's, it's less prominent, this uh, focus on digital than what we think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, I can only 
I can only talk about what's in the public sector because I wouldn't know what's under investigation at DOJ. Um, and but you know when you talk about the Department of Justice, the FTC, the 50 attorney generals, and then all the private litigation in the United States. Um, you see a mix of incredibly resource intensive cases and investigations relating to the tech platforms. And then you see some of the hyper local things that um, affect people's lives. So I'm, I'm physically in Chicago. Um, there's a pending supermarket merger between two national chains that in Chicago mean that the two biggest supermarkets would be united. That's what's on people's minds. You know, uh, the FTC is doing these huge cases that are, they never have enough attorneys, you know, they're never gonna have as much resources as the defendants. But at the same time, they're litigating hospital mergers in a particular city um, uh, where competition is likely to be harmed uh, if the merger goes through. So it's just a mix and uh, there's no other way around that. It would be irresponsible to do either one or the other. Um, and I've seen cases as localized as non-compete agreements that affect uh, you know, security guards and home health care workers in a particular area of, of Florida or something like that. Um, and obviously, you know, these litigation uh, involving the conduct and acquisitions of the tech platforms, which are going to take years to resolve. Um, and in, in most of those situations, the EU has acted uh, earlier and has better, better uh, tools in their toolkit. So um, it's a mix. Uh, and and um, if we broaden it from just the US and the EU, um, I think it's a real challenge for a newer or smaller agency how much it wants to get into this uh, resource intensive game. Uh, it, it, it's just as important for their economies as it is for ours. Um, but if you, you know, if you only have a couple dozen professionals to, to uh, run an agency, it's a very hard question how many of those people you want to dedicate to one or more of the tech platforms as we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Yanis uh, Lianos, and thank you, Spencer Weber Waller. Um, uh, grateful to both of you. Uh, we've uh, exceeded our time um, five, seven minutes, but uh, this was in an effort to uh, respond to the uh, to a question as well. Um, and in general, I think uh, I hope this has been exactly what it promised to be. So, without um, uh, doing a very granular analysis of one particular uh, matter uh, of competition law. We have had very many broad looks into the evolution of um, uh, competition law and different streams of competition law. Um, I've, I sure enough have learned uh, a lot from it uh, and I thank you, for, uh, uh, thank both of you for that. Uh, and I look forward to uh, um, seeing you in person, hopefully, um, uh, and uh, I also uh, hope to circulate the video link uh, of this particular video recording so that more people can um, uh, take advantage of uh, the uh, wisdom, information, and know-how uh, in this particular uh, session. Uh, thanks a lot, Yanis Spence.